So I want to begin by telling you all about one of the couples I've been studying for some time now, the Davises. Elvis met Travis Davis when she was working in one of his furniture factories. They fell in love and began a relationship. Shortly thereafter, Elvis quit her job and concentrated on making a home for Travis, Tonya, their daughter, and the couple's children from prior relationships. After building a home together, Elvis painted doors and hung wallpaper. She sewed curtains and bedspreads, shirts and children's clothes. She maintained the swimming pool, took care of the yard and animals, gardened and preserved homegrown vegetables. Meanwhile, Travis managed a number of companies. His net worth grew from about $850,000 at the beginning of their relationship to nearly 10 times that amount by the end. Throughout the course of their relationship, Elvis was always provided with whatever she needed. Elvis and Travis never married. After 13 years together, they broke up when Travis announced that he was in love with his secretary. So what happens to their property? What happens when unmarried couples separate and disagree about who owns what and what was promised to each other during the course of their relationship? An answer that is all too common in law school is that they went to court. But what do courts do when rules of divorce, which apply to married couples and which tell courts guide them to divide the assets either equitably or equally, don't apply? Before I answer that question, let me tell you why this is an important issue to consider. Non-marital families are not very much studied in law. Family law is centrally focused on marriage and marital families. Until very recently, family law textbooks only addressed marital families because they were the norm. And non-marital families were nowhere to be seen because they were a departure from that norm, an aberration. And when they did address these non-marital families, they were often as an aside in chapters titled The Non-Traditional Family. But non-marital relationships are at an all-time high. Currently, about 19 million individuals live in relationships outside of marriage. And about 40% of children, nearly half of all children, are born to parents who are not married. So I've been studying the court cases of people like Elvis and Travis for four years now. And there's a clear pattern that emerges. In particular, courts divide the assets of Elvis and Travis by relying on legal rules that used to regulate marriage in the 1700s. That is, unmarried couples who separate, courts address them by using doctrines that once applied in marriage. But they're so archaic, so traditional, that they've actually been discarded in marriage proper. Yet outside of marriage, they are alive and well. So what I thought I would do today is tell you a little bit about these old family law rules that used to regulate marriage. I'll then show you how they're currently being applied in contemporary non-marital case law. And then we'll end by considering whether any of this matters, why any of this matters, which has everything to do with how we define families and whether they are aberrant. Coverture was the common law regime that regulated husbands and wives once they married. It dictated that by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. So the wife upon marriage lost her own legal identity. The term coverture comes from the fact that her husband literally covered her, cloaked her in his own legal identity. The effects of coverture impacted both women and men in their roles as husband and wives. It had particularly wide-ranging consequences on the wife. Upon marriage, the wife lost her ability to own property, to control her real property. She lost the ability to enter into contracts, sign her own contracts, to sue or be sued without having her husband joined in the action. She lost her ability to execute deeds or wills. So you see that she was greatly disabled by this regime. The husband also had certain concomitant duties imposed upon him. He had to pay for her 
debts and any torts she committed. He also had to pay for any necessaries accrued throughout the course of the relationship. He also had the right to moderately correct her or to chastise her, which is exactly what you think it is. Okay, so clearly times have changed. A woman no longer loses the right to contract upon marrying, nor does she lose her right to control her own property. Husbands no longer have the right to chastise their wives, however mildly. The very structure of marriage has changed too. It is no longer limited to a man and a woman, right? But we have now allowed same-sex couples to enter into the institution. And in a lot of ways, coverture has been abolished in marriage proper. Coverture is widely understood to have been eliminated by a series of acts passed at the turn of the 19th century when states held that married women could retain their own property and their income. But there are certain features of coverture that remain surprisingly intact outside of marriage. And I focus on three that implicated the relationship between husband and wife and the rights to property. So the first of these features is the way that coverture defined the marital roles that husbands and wives took on upon marrying. So coverture provided duties that both the wife and husband had to take on. In addition to the ones you just saw, the wife had the specific duty to provide services to her husband, and the husband had the specific duty to provide his wife with support. In this way, then, coverture provided actual content to the marital relationship. Second, coverture imposed a division between wife and worker. The wife, by virtue of her duties to provide services, remained within the home, while the husband, by virtue of his, entered the workforce to be able to gain an income to provide support to his wife. Now, the wife's work, which was done within the home, was not subject to a market exchange, and no value accrued to the wife. Rather, it was the husband who had a right to her services, who received the benefit and the value of her work. Finally, coverture functioned as a property regime that denied the wife access to any property. We saw the wife upon marrying lost control over any real property like land that she owned, and instead her husband could use it, possess it, and gain an income from it. She also lost all her rights to any personal property she owned. So coverture was explicitly a property regime that consolidated property in the hands of the husband. So let's return to our couple, Elvis and Travis. Can we identify any remnants of coverture in how the law treats them? So at the conclusion of their relationship, Elvis went to court seeking help to divide the assets that were all titled in Travis's name. The court, however, and this is the Supreme Court of Mississippi, denied Elvis any property. To decline marriage, according to the court, had been folly under the circumstances. When opportunity knocks, it advised, one must answer its call. Because Elvis failed to do so, her claim is all for naught. At the end of this relationship then, where the role is so neatly mapped onto female homemaker, male provider, the court declined to distribute any property, reasoning that this relationship should have taken place within marriage if it were to have led to any property distribution. So this happens across the board, where the court decides that the relationship involved an individual who acted too much like a wife and the other individual acted too much like a husband, they declined to distribute property because they're stating that this is exactly the type of relationship that should have taken place within marriage. So they're defining marriage the way that coverture used to. They're placing certain types of relationships, very ideal traditional relationships, within that legal status. Okay, second, the second feature of coverture that remains in these cases is the idea that services provided in the home in the context of an intimate relationship are rendered gratuitously. So Elvis here received no money for the services she provided, and courts across the board deny property at the conclusion of a relationship where the individual seeking it engaged in homemaking services. But they do remunerate contributions when those contributions were in the form of money or finances, financial contribution. There courts say, okay, we will give that back because we don't think that you gave that without the expectation of getting that money back. So what explains this division? That services like preserving homegrown vegetables or taking care of the children or maintaining the home are rendered for free, but everything else isn't. 
it only makes sense if we think that these services are part of the relationship, which again has its roots in coverture. It only makes sense if we understand these services as duties owed to the other individual in the context of an intimate relationship. Finally, the most disabling aspect of coverture that remains throughout these cases is denying access to the individual seeking it at the conclusion of a non-marital relationship. So Elvis received no property at the end of her 13-year relationship. And courts generally refuse to distribute property outside of marriage. And if they do distribute, it is very little. So refusing to remunerate homemaking services, denying that individual who undertook them access to property, that's a classic example of the continuing influence of coverture. Yet in many ways, the condition outside of marriage is broader than it was under coverture. Coverture impacted husbands and wives. Now, you see these decisions affecting both different sex and same-sex relationships, and men and women, as long as they were the individuals who undertook the homemaking activities. So, if you buy into my account that coverture is still lurking, what follows? But it obviously matters if we think that these decisions are unfair. But it also matters because it makes us fundamentally question what is the norm and what is aberrant? What is the departure from that norm? The term aberrant is both descriptive in that it describes how things are, but it is also normative in that it contains a view of how things should be. It implicates a judgment. And whether a topic is aberrant depends on what perspective we adopt. For instance, the number of non-marital relationships is at an all-time high, as I mentioned. Marriage is no longer the only way of organizing one's intimate relationships. In this context, then, marriage is non-marriage is not an aberration, but rather an alternative to marriage. But from a legal point of view, non-marital relationships continue to be aberrant. They are outsiders in terms of how the law approaches them, which continues to be through the framework of marriage. So even though these non-marital relationships are increasing in number, they have no direct system of regulation. Additionally, the line between what is the norm and what is an aberration is less clear than one might first assume. The more I work outside of the norm, the more I see how the norm itself is constructed. What do I mean by this? The farther away from marriage we get, the more steeped in marriage the rules regulating relationships are. The more non-traditional the relationships are, the more traditional the rules that regulate them continue to be. So these aberrant spaces then function to create and construct what the norm is, what an ideal marriage is or should be. And they continue to have force because they're taking place outside of the limelight of marriage. In these aberrant, unseen spaces, we don't pay enough attention to. But if we understand what the norm is, to be constructed, if we understand that it's a choice, then that means that it is changeable, malleable, subject to question and to critique. Looking to these aberrant spaces then may give us a way of understanding how the norm is created and whether we agree with it descriptively and normatively. This is an important realization in particular in the context of the family. Families are often understood as entities that exist free from regulation. They're just out there naturally the way they are. But it's important to identify the ways in which families are regulated and constructed, the ways in which families are creatures of law. So before I, we end, I want to look at how Justice Bradley described the natural order of things in the case of Bradwell versus Illinois, decided by the Supreme Court in 1872. And I love teaching this case to my law students who involve both men and women, because in it, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld the Illinois Bar's decision to prevent women from being admitted to the bar, from joining the legal profession. And Justice Bradley wrote in concurrence, explaining why he agreed with this decision. And he explained that the reason why was that the paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. And he relied both on a description of the family and also on the legal system at the time to reach his conclusion. He explained that the constitution of the family organization, which is founded in the divine ordinance and 
in the nature of things, indicates the domestic sphere as that which properly belongs to the domain and functions of womanhood. Moreover, he identifies coverture explicitly, what we've just been dis discussing, that system of jurisprudence that a woman has no legal existence separate from her husband. We now have the benefit of hindsight to see that Justice Bradley wasn't explaining the way things were, but rather was explaining how things should be. Indeed, at this time, the role of women were changing right before his eyes. You have here Myra Bradwell, who is bringing this case to court to request to gain admission to the bar, to become a lawyer. Yet Justice Bradley is intent on keeping her within the home, exclusively as a wife and mother. At the time of Justice Bradley's decision, coverture was visible as a legal regime. Now it is submerged, embedded in these non-marital spaces. Yet the division that Justice Bradley identifies exists to this day. Work done within the home is not subject to a market exchange, while work outside of the home is. Work done within the home does not get valued. It is labeled as effective or altruistic, while work outside of the home is routinely valued and brings in an income. But now we have to look really hard to see how and where coverture is a part of maintaining and reifying these divisions. Indeed, the vitality of coverture is largely due to its stealth. Uncovering the ways in which it is still present helps us question whether we want it to be perpetuated and preserved. If the answer is that we don't, then we can now begin to reconsider, to question, to critique the ways in which the law actively regulates these aberrant spaces in the most traditional of ways. Thank you.